Welcome again to WPAT Live. Thank you for joining. Uh, feel free to leave comments. I try to stay focused, so I may not um, have time to go through all of the comments, but I do thank you for joining me on this morning. Or if you're watching, uh, of course, at a later date, this video will be available on this page as well as my YouTube channel, WPAT Live and uh, the website, wpatlive.com. So today's word is overwhelmed, overwhelmed. And I don't know about you, but there have been many times in my life in general that I have been overwhelmed. And then in particular seasons, uh, I have been overwhelmed. Uh, never mind the being a writer, publisher, uh, pursuing my gift, you know, making sure that I am uh, exercising my gift in the way that God would want, but just life in general. Sometimes you're overwhelmed. So we're going to take a look at that word on today with uh, the case study. Now we started out, I love doing case studies with Bible studies. We started out with Moses and we went to uh, Jeremiah, then Gideon. And um, now we're going to be taking a look at Jesus. He's going to be our case study for this morning as we talk about the word overwhelmed. So we are in Mark, the first chapter, and we're also going to be in Luke, the 15th chapter. Now I'm going to start there because Luke gives a synopsis in two verses of what Mark expands in many verses. And so I want to start with Luke's uh, recap of the, um, I have to take my glasses off. I don't need them for close up. <laughs> so, uh, but I did need them to see the screen there. So Mark 15 and 16 is a recap of what we're going to be talking about on today. The word overwhelmed the word overwhelmed. And our case study this morning is Jesus. And it's Mark 16, 15. And uh, as always, I have my Bible, I have my notebook, and I may share from one of my books, maybe not. But we're gonna start with the book. Just one moment here. Things happen and are moved around on your screen. Okay, it's Mark, I'm sorry, it's Luke 5. I guess I did need my glasses, huh? It's Mark 5, 15 and 16. <laughs> But so much the more went out the fame abroad of him, of Jesus. Great multitudes came together to hear and to be healed by him of their infirmities. And he withdrew himself into the wilderness and prayed. So that's kind of the recap of what we're going to talk about today as it relates to being overwhelmed. Once again, great multitudes came together to hear and be healed of him, of their infirmities, and he withdrew himself into the wilderness and prayed. That's the recap, Mark, Luke 5, 15 and 16, but we're going to be in Mark, the first chapter from verses 21 to 39. I'm not going to read the entire uh <clears throat> passage at once. We're going to look at it bit by bit like we have uh, every week, and we're going to look at this word overwhelmed, and we're going to see what we can glean from our Savior as he uh, has left these instructions and these lessons for us in, in relation to life in general and in relation to our gifts. So there are five phases I want to talk about on this morning with the word overwhelmed. Being overwhelmed sometimes happens all at once. Something happens, 
and you are overwhelmed. It's, it's, it's one incident, but many times overwhelmed is like that pot boiling, it simmers, then the bubbles start and it happens over time you get a boil. Most of the time being overwhelmed is a gradual thing. One thing happens, then another thing happens, then another, then another, and then you realize you are overwhelmed. So Mark chapter one, verses 21 through 39 is being overwhelmed over time. And how do you handle that? How did our savior handle that? The scriptures don't specifically say, let me say in the beginning that he was overwhelmed, but if any one of us was in this situation, certainly we would be. And so let us start with phase one. Mark chapter one, verses 21, 22, 23, and 26. They went to Capernaum and straightway on the Sabbath, he entered into the synagogue and taught. They were astonished at his doctrine for he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. And there in the synagogue was a man with an unclean spirit, verse 26. And when the un and Jesus rebuked him, verse 25, hold thy peace and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had torn him and cried with a loud voice, he came out. Many were astonished, etc. We're going to pause there. So phase one, Jesus is in the synagogue teaching. A young man comes in. Well, it doesn't say young. A man comes in. He's possessed with a demon. Jesus speaks to the demon and the demon flees. Okay, and people are astonished. That's phase one. Phase two, verse 29, 30, and 31. When they, which is Jesus and his disciples, were come out of the synagogue, they entered into the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. But Simon's wife's mother, Simon's mother-in-law, <laughs> was sick with a fever and they went to tell him about her. And he, Jesus, took her by the hand, lifted her up and immediately the fever came out of her and she ministered unto them. Okay, so he's at the temple, he's teaching, he, uh, he delivers this man from demon possession he goes home, somebody, not home, he goes to the disciples' home, somebody there is sick with a fever. They come to him, can you help her? He helps her. All right. Phase three, Mark 30, uh, Mark 1, verse 32 to 34. When the sun did set, they brought, they, the disciples, brought unto him, Jesus, all who were diseased, and them who were possessed with devils. And all the city, verse 33, gathered together at the door. And he healed many that were sick of diverse diseases, different diseases, cast out many devils, and suffered not the devils to speak because they knew them. Okay, so it's not enough that he's teaching in the synagogue. He's, he pauses in his teaching to deliver someone. He goes home. He goes to the home, there's someone sick. Yes, I'll heal her, of course. That's what I came for. And then not, what did they do? Did they, did they let him rest? Did they give him a break? No, they brought all the sick of the whole city to the house, to the door, the scripture says. And he did what? He healed them, he delivered them, and that brings us to phase four, the whole crux of this lesson and our example of what to do when we're overwhelmed. Now, if any of us had been in this situation that Jesus was in or any situation where you're at work, something happens, you're, you're doing your job and then you, you know, it's, uh, something in the middle of it interrupts it, you deal with it. You go home, 
you're thinking you're going to go home, you're going to rest and relax. As soon as you get in the door, there's an issue you have to deal with. As soon as you get home, you deal with that issue. You get ready to relax. And before you know it, there's so much more that needs your attention. Uh, not a multitude of people sick and filled with demons coming to your door, but issues and things popping up in the household. Overwhelmed, being overwhelmed. So verse 35 is our example. I'm going to read through it and then I'm going to um, go through my what I got out of it. Verse 35, and in the morning, rising up a great while before the day, he, Jesus, went out and departed into a solitary place, and there he prayed. Mark 1, verse 35, being overwhelmed. Jesus had a day. What a day. Yes, he was Jesus, but he came in the flesh to leave examples for us of how we should live and lessons of how that we can apply to our daily lives. And so whether we're writers or whatever we are, as we're trying to live and exercise our gift and walk on our purpose, at times we become overwhelmed. One thing happens, then there another, then another, then another, interrupting or sidetracking us from our purpose. And maybe it's part of our purpose. You know, these things come up in our lives. And if we're not careful, if we don't follow the example that Jesus left in verse 35, we can find ourselves being so overwhelmed. We're not able to go on. We're not able to walk in our purpose. We're not able to pursue higher heights and deeper depths in our gifts. And remembering that threefold, according to me, <laughs> Threefold purpose for our gifts, glorify God, edify the body of Christ, you know, edify fellow believers, and then evangelize the world. Those three things won't be done if we let life circumstances overwhelm us to the point where we can't go on, even if it's temporary. So what did Jesus do? The first part of this verse 35, it says in the morning. So that lets you know that Jesus took time to rest and go to sleep. He had physical rest. Physical rest releases your stress. You have got to get your sleep. It's a, it's a, um, it sounds like a common thing, but a lot of times when you're overwhelmed and you're stressed out, you don't sleep. And you think you got to deal with all these issues. So you, you know, pull the all-nighters, quote unquote. But what happens is you're not letting your body and your mind rest. And so what you think you're doing by accomplishing all these goals and being overwhelmed, and I can't stop to take care of myself. I got too much else to do. You're only making matters worse. So if Jesus could sleep, and rest and wait until the next morning, so can you and I. So the number one thing is rest. Resting your body, resting your mind, resting your spirit. Okay, the next part of that verse says, in the morning, okay, first was in the morning, that was one. Number two, rising up a great while before the day. Jesus had a set time to wake up, it was scheduled. It was intentional. He intentionally woke up before the day. Okay, so he woke up early. He had a plan, as we'll see, and he had a goal. And so he, he kept to his schedule. So part two, which can help you in being overwhelmed, have a schedule and stick to it as much as you can. Of course, things happen in life and you get sidetracked, but as soon as you can re you know, regroup, you rest it, now you regroup and you get back on your schedule and you stick to your schedule. Trust me, a schedule will help you write it out if you have to, put it in your phone, have an alarm. Um, I have an alarm. Uh, sometimes I set it, depends on the season in my life. They'll tell me it's time to go to bed. It's time to turn the television off. It's time to wind down for the day. It's time to have your meditation and prayer and go to bed. 
So um, it, some people have a schedule on their phone to take the reminder to take their medicine. Having a schedule will help you avoid becoming overwhelmed. The next thing Jesus did, verse 35, Mark 1, he went out and departed to a solitary place. A lot of times when you're overwhelmed, people are in your ear, projects are in front of your face, trouble is on your mind, and you're overwhelmed, you're overwhelmed. You need to separate yourself from everyone. You need to just pull away sometimes. And not just pull away from the people, but sometimes it's good for you to go to a place, you know, take a walk, leave the house. If you're working 12 hour days and you're taking lunch and if like I used to do, this is why I know when I, when I worked a normal nine to five, I would never leave the building. I would have breaks at my desk. I would have lunch at my desk. The only time I would get up from my desk is if a supervisor called me to do something or if I had to go to the restroom. I, or I would order my lunch, go get it delivered, bring it back to my desk and eat. Sometimes you have to leave the place where you are. You need to leave the house, go for a walk, uh, go outside. If it's just sitting on the porch, walk around, you um, walk around the block once or just go stand outside and just look, just feel the air. With COVID uh, and quarantines and stay at home orders that have happened in the last year, uh, a lot of people have not been going outside and there's a natural something that our body needs. It's sunlight. And there have been studies and reports have shown that vitamin D deficiency is, it lessens your immune system and leaves you vulnerable, more vulnerable to certain diseases. So even physically getting outside, getting some sunshine, leaving where you are, going for a walk, breathing in the air um, can help you, you know, break that overwhelming season. And then the last thing Jesus did, which is the most important thing, when he, when he woke up, when he got his rest physically, he slept that night, he got up the next morning early on his schedule, he went out, he left the house, and he left the people in the house. And the last thing that verse says, and there he prayed. And prayer. When we are overwhelmed with situations within and without, whether it's something internal going on or whether it's something outside of us. Uh, it, now, there are perimeters. It could be something outside of us, but in our immediate family, in our home, in our church. Maybe it could be, you know, you, the world, what's happening with COVID, what's happening with, you know, uh, the violence going throughout this land. And you're sitting there watching or listening to news report after news report, and you're you're feeling overwhelmed with the cares of this world. Once you've rested your body, you've rested your mind, you've gotten up early, you're on your schedule, you've, you've gone for this walk, you've separated yourself from where you are and the people around you. If prayer is not a part of your formula, then you're not going to break that overwhelming feeling. What does the scripture say? When my heart is overwhelmed within me, Psalm 63, 62, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. And we talk about that rock being Jesus. That rock is Jesus. That's an old hymn or old devotional song. That rock is Jesus, the only one. Be very sure. Be very sure. Your anchor holds and grips a solid rock. And how does that start off? In times like these, in overwhelming times, when sickness is striking everywhere, when violence is striking everywhere, in times like these, we need a savior. In times like these, we need an anchor. So we need to be very sure our anchor is holding and gripping what? That solid rock, which is Jesus. 
when our heart is overwhelmed within us. I just meshed the verse together with the hymn, I know. <laughs> but the bottom line is that prayer, when you're overwhelmed, must be a part of your formula to fix it. It must be a part of your solution when you're overwhelmed. When you're overwhelmed when it comes to writing and publishing or whatever your gift may be. If you have the cares of this life has so overwhelmed you, that you can't function, you can't walk in your purpose, you can't fulfill God's will for your life, prayer is the key to letting that go in prayer, bringing it before the Savior, leaving it there, and going on with your day. I was talking to my son uh, yesterday um, I was feeling a little down about a couple of different things. And this is real talk. I called my son and um, he just, we talked for over an hour and he doesn't even realize uh, how much just talking to him and just hearing, you know, saying hello to my grandbaby in the background and listening to her play and laugh and giggling you know, catching up with different things going on in my son's life and, you know, didn't even say anything about what was worrying me, just talking to him. You know, and then I hung up from him. I called one of my, well, I was talking to uh, later on in the day, woman of God that um, I admire, uh, strong in the Lord. When I talked last week about, you know, talking to, a, you know, having an accountability partner, who you trust spiritually, that's the key talking it over with her, you know, asking, you know, just confiding some things and getting prayer and advice, hung up from her, felt a little better, feel a little better, better, a little better, but not until I prayed in the middle of the day, midday prayer, not until I prayed through did the overwhelming feeling dissipate. So the answer to oh, being overwhelmed, you get your physical rest, you separate yourself because you don't want your stress and your worry and being overwhelmed to, to pollute up other people around you. That's why, you know, going for a walk sometimes, getting, you know, getting out of the uh, house or whatever. If you can't, if you're immobile, if you can't get out of the house, you know what I'll do sometimes? I'll just pause. I'll just open the blinds, open the window and turn my chair around to face the, the outside and just listen to the traffic and the feel the breeze and escape mentally, you know, those mental vacations. Those are some of the things that can help you when you're feeling overwhelmed. And what happened at the end, phase five, is, as I'm wrapping up now, Phase five, Mark 1, 36 to 39, after Jesus prayed, and Simon and they that were with him followed him. And when they found him, they said, all men seek for thee. Mm. I love this verse. It's a separate topic altogether. All men seek thee. And Jesus said, let's go to the next town that I may preach there also for therefore I came forth. And he preached in their synagogues throughout all Galilee and cast out devils. Jesus continued his purpose. He realized the next morning after he went to a solitude, and there's so many different passages in scripture. This says Jesus went to a mountain to pray. Jesus left them in the boat. They went ashore. He went over there and he prayed. He's constantly separating himself from others and praying. And that's our example when we are overwhelmed. We need time to regroup. I wrote it down so I wouldn't forget. We need time to regroup, re rest, regroup, and replenish. We rest, we regroup, and we replenish. And then we can continue on with our purpose, with our purpose. So tips, some practical tips for uh, perfecting your gift of writing and pursuing self-publishing. Don't let life overwhelm you to the point 
where you can't produce, where you can't walk in your purpose. Realign yourself spiritually, rest your body and your mind, regroup, stay on a schedule. Give yourself a schedule. When it comes to writing, some people can only write under inspiration and they have to wait until they feel it, they hear the words, they're inspired by something they see, something happens and they're able to write. But nine out of 10 places where you will go to get information on how, how do you, you know, keep writing? How do you, everywhere will tell you, and I will tell you too, you have to have a schedule. Even if, if that schedule, it doesn't have to be every day. It doesn't have to be every week, but it should be a schedule. You, if you want to perfect your gift, what do basketball players and baseball players and football players do? They practice. And sometimes they don't feel like it, but they practice. Um, even, even when you're in a team, sometimes you'll be overwhelmed, but you still, as that team, you have to come together and you have to practice if you're in a team. And even if you're by yourself, uh, let's say if you play golf, you know, that's a solitary sport. You don't have a team. It's you and the golf balls and the golf, whatever, rods. <laughs> you're practicing by yourself. You're, you're on a schedule. You rest, you practice. It's the same with writing. When it comes to writing, uh, what I do is I make sure that every single day I am connected to my writing in some way. Even if it's just reviewing a future project, I'm not ready to start it yet, but my eyes are on just like my eyes are on the Bible every day, my eyes are on my work every day, every day. So if you can't write every day, you need to be reviewing your schedule, your plans. Have you written out, you know, your vision for your next book? You may not be ready to write the next book, but you should be doing something every day towards that goal. You can't sit down and write a book. I don't care how many Facebook ads you see. Write a book in three days. It's, you know, those people, they have already started. They have an old manuscript somewhere. What they're doing is zipping through it real quick and putting something together in three days. But you have to do a little bit every day. And some days you'll, you'll if, you, if you say 10 minutes a day, I'm going to write something. Some days you're only going to, it's going to be a struggle to get past five minutes. But some days you're not even going to look up at the clock. You're just going to be writing and writing and writing. And before you realize it, an hour's going by. But the point is to stick to a schedule. Let your eyes look at something, some project of yours every day. Reread something that you wrote you weren't quite satisfied with. I'm not quite satisfied with this paragraph or that chapter or this poem or that verse or this title. Rewrite it. Read it out loud. That's another tip. Read your work out loud. I'm, and I don't just mean if it's a poem. <clears throat> Read your work out loud. If you're writing a, a, a memoir, if you're writing a self-help book, if you're writing a novel, read your work out loud. I've been, uh, because of the church I grew up in and the, and the Sunday school uh, methods, I have been reciting poetry before I even knew what a book report was in school, go up in front of the class and read, read the book report. We were trained in Sunday school. Every Sunday, every child, had to go up front and say what they learned that day. Every, from the beginner's class, the babies on up. And they would pass that mic. And that was training. Did We didn't even realize it. 
but that was training us for public speaking, for confidence, for how to stand, how to speak, how to speak into the microphone, getting comfortable with all, all of that was training from Sunday school. <laughs> so it, it, it's some, for some people, it's just, it's easy to then, okay, now I'm a writer and they tell me, read, read my work out loud. Oh, okay. But for others, it may not be, it may not be that easy, um, but it, it's helpful. Trust me, it's helpful. When you write something and you read it out loud, you'll even, I, even myself, I still catch myself if I say something out loud that I'm writing, no, that don't sound right. Mm -mm. Let's change that word. Let's change that. Because when you hear it back, and it's what you do when you're reading. When you're reading something, you're actually hearing your voice read it out loud. You're reading a novel or if you're reading uh, a, uh, a memoir by someone else, you're hearing yourself mentally in your mind, reading it out loud. So read your work out loud. That's a tip, that's a practical tip. So I'll stop there, um, we're past 8.30. I'm trying to, I'm trying to, uh, I'm, I know I'm long-winded, I'm trying, I'm trying to work on that. So read your work out loud, have a writing schedule and stick to it as much as you can, as much as life allows. And even if you start small, I'm gonna write 10 minutes a day or five minutes a day, uh, something. Let your eyes, lay your eyes on your work every day. Lay your eyes on your work every day. So those are your three practical tips. The spiritual tips were from our lesson today, from Mark chapter one, verse 21 to 39. And Luke chapter 5, verse 15 and 16, as it relates to being overwhelmed, how something could be make you overwhelmed, and how do you break that habit? And the, the highlighting verse was verse 35 of Mark 1. So I hope that um, this has been a help to you today. Thank you again for joining me and I appreciate it so much. I see some comments. So now that I have gotten everything out, I want to say good morning and hello to my little sis Latoya, Sister Shanika Thompson. Hey, Sister Brown. Sister Wilfredia Fields, praise the Lord. How are you? Thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining me on this morning. Please keep me in your prayers. And don't forget, you've commented, please like and share. Please like and share. And remember that uh, you can watch this episode here on this page. You can also watch it on my YouTube channel, WPAT Live, like and subscribe. And uh, I'll be back next week with our word for the day, our Bible lesson, and some practical tips to help you perfect your gift of writing. So until next week, take care and be blessed. Thank you so much.